welcome everyone. I'm so excited to have Susie Carter today, also known as the Profit Coach, and her tagline is Wealth is Our Birthright. And um, she is just an extraordinary soul who I had the pleasure of meeting back in February of this year. And, you know, what's fascinating about Susie is that she's had um, a couple of obstacles and uh, or traumatic experiences in her life too but no matter what life has thrown her way she's always found a way to rise up she is the catalyst and behind uh, lisa nichols steve harvey and others and she is just somebody who authentically helps people rise up to their own level of greatness and helps them create a business that can run without them um susie is there anything else that you would like to say about who you are for the listeners here today? If not, I want to just jump right in and to ask you a bunch of questions and how you got to be where you are today and help helping thousands of people around the world. Well, I think it's uh, yes. Um, you know, what's interesting is people assume or that you make up who this person is, what their journey is, you know, and especially a profit coach. And immediately you think I have some MBA or some, you know, I'm an accountant, CPA. I am none of that girl. I'm a rogue entrepreneur. I had to figure out this money thing, you know, grew up in a very large family. You know, there was nine kids in Bobby, Ronnie, Stevie, Terry, Joni, Shelley, Susie, Kelly, Debbie, right. And 1200 square feet. And I didn't know wealth was my birthright. I just knew poor and there's no money. And so what I love about adult learning, what I love about the human brain is when you're committed to something, you can make anything happen. That's what I love about our country, no matter what the dysfunction is, right? I played victim for a very long time. You know, that served me, woes me. I had a hard childhood, woes me. My mother abandoned me, woes me. I was abused, but that wasn't getting me anywhere, but woes me. And, you know, something pivotal happened in my life that I said, I, I can't be in woes me. I need to take action. If it's meant to be, it's up to me. Now, I know that sounds cliche, but I knew that no matter what happened, I had to make it happen. And there was no safety net. There was no back door. There was no, there was no man on a white horse that was going to save my little butt. <laughs> so, really? really? I came to that reality. I will get on the white horse and save my own ass. That's what I'm just going to say right now. And so I think knowing that and knowing your story, knowing my story and that rise that, uh, uh, is going, I think you use those challenges to propel you. Like I use those challenges to make me mad, to, I needed that anger to fuel me for a long time, right? To go, you can't tell me no, you can't hold me down, you can't, right? And then realize, oh, let me have a little softness about this journey. <laughs> let me have some grace around this journey versus killing everybody off that came in my path. There are a lot of dead bodies back there. I can and realize so I can get so much more with kindness and love and then anger and hostility. So I, I just share that to go, you know, don't pigeonhole me. You can judge me at the end of this interview and go uh, love her, adore her, like uh, she's my people or eh, not my jam. That's okay too. I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'd rather surround myself with people that are ride or die than looky lose people that are like, well, if you don't, you don't, if you do, you do. My, my goal is to help entrepreneurs learn it quicker, faster. Don't go through what I had to go through. And I really started teaching. I really started sharing my message to go, holy hell, Batman, there's a better way. Oh my gosh, how come nobody's teaching us this? Oh my God, how come nobody tells the truth? They just sit on their mountaintop and go, build a website and they will come, start a membership and they'll sign up. No, I call bull, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I love being transparent. I love telling the truth. Some people don't like that and that's okay too. But for me as an individual to go, just tell me what it's going to be. And I'm like a little Xerox machine. Show me how to do it. I'll do it. Show me how to do it. I'll do it. Yeah. And I, I, love, that about, I love that about you because you are the real deal. You are transparent. You know, when I first had the opportunity to meet you, you shared so much about, you know, the struggles that you've endured in your life, but how you've found a way to dig deeper within yourself to rise up and to no longer be that victim and to no longer, you know, hope and pray that someone's going to save the day. Like guys, <laughs> like, no one's coming to save you. You've got to save yourself. And that's the key here. You know, you know, for those of you that meditate and pray and all that, I totally believe in that stuff, but 
you have to take action to create results in your life. That's the bottom line. And so, um, and can you tell us a little bit about some of the, the hardships that you've had, not to get into, I don't want to go too far into that, but I want people to understand that this is real stuff that every other, you know, that a lot of people have dealt with. And yet you found a way to rise up when circumstances, the economy, the situations externally were not in your favor. So how did you do it? Well, I think there's always some kind of pandemic. There's some kind of recession or depression. You'll you'll always have relationship challenges, right? So again, we grew up in, in a very large family. My Both of my parents were blue collar workers. Education was not the priority. The priority was get married, get a job. My early childhood was very abusive, both sexually, physically, verbally. Like I should not be where I'm at, right? When I look back and, or I talk to someone, like I talked to my man, he's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry that was your experience. But I didn't know any different. It did make me stronger, right? It made me angry, but it made me stronger. And so I, I left home at 17, right? There was nine of us. My dad's philosophy was when you're 18, move out. I'm like, I'm just going to save you the challenge. I'm just going to move out now. Not knowing what that meant, you know, and from that day forward, never looked back, right? I've always worked two jobs, three jobs, hustle, try to make it happen. Um, I met my first husband, my kid's dad, when I was um, 17, right? He was 26, I thought he was the Adonis. Oh, girl, he was beautiful. He was this chocolate, muscly, handsome manager, right? I worked at a men's clothing store. He was the manager, you know, and he was a marathon runner, triathlete, you know, so he was fit. Girl, I I kissed him and I, I saw, I don't know the difference between love and lust. Let me just say that. So married him, but you know what? Again, my family did not agree with the marriage. They were against it because he was black. So my family disowned me. And so that made me fight more for the relationship. And then we had kids. And then people were prejudiced. Now, I've been around prejudice my whole life. But when you when people are prejudiced to children just because of the color of their skin, and prejudiced towards us because I was married to this man, I just didn't understand. Like, you don't know him. You don't know me. You don't know our journey. You don't know. And that's just for the world we live in. And so the black community didn't accept me. The white community didn't accept me. Like, I've always chosen these paths that made me thrive, that made me choose to rise and thrive. Like, choose it. Like, I could be victim to it or I can make it happen. Well, of course, I found myself repeating the past of my mother, right? Abusive, verbally abusive, Right. So this fantasy of this relationship and I stayed longer than I should because I didn't want to make my family right. And that was that was hard. And I left with no alimony, no child support. My oldest daughter was 18 months. The youngest one was 18 or six months. Sorry, 18 months and six months when I left and had to figure out how to make a living. Now, I was a hairdresser back then. So I had to figure out, okay, now there's no longer the back door. There's no longer security. I was in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? When you think about that at school in food shelter clothing, right? Once I got food shelter clothing handled, then I was security. I want to make sure I have money in the bank. I can provide for my children. Nobody will ever pull the rug out from under me again. It made me fiercely independent, fiercely protective of my children. Right. And the day that I left Jennifer, and this might, pl this might bring some stuff up for people. So I just want to say that before I say this is I was on the floor, he was on top of me and my oldest child who's 18 months has the baby who's six months crying, watching this 200 pound man on top of this 110 pound lady. And I looked at my children and I went, Oh my God, I'm repeating the pattern. It was like God spoke to me and stopped me and said, watch what you're doing. I didn't know what I was doing because I was fighting for this relationship that everybody said wouldn't work. And I'm sitting there going, this isn't working. Everybody's right. And that's the day I made the decision to rise, get up and get out no matter what. Luckily, I had some amazing girlfriends that surrounded me and said, we got you. Now, 
they just made sure that I was safe, right? I, I rented a room with another girlfriend and we just made it happen. Like I got that hustle muscle on. When you don't have a back door in business or in life, you move forward. There's too many times our parents save us or a significant other saves us or a friend saves us. Like there's a back door that'll that allows you to stay in your victimhood or martyrism. I was a martyr girl. I remember my one of my coaches said, you are a martyr. I'm like, I am not a martyr. What is that? <laughs> it just didn't sound good, but I was. I was like, woe's me. I did it again. I repeated it. I sounded very awake, but I was not awake. <laughs> and so that was the first realization that I could do anything. I didn't do it right. I didn't build a million dollar business. I was in survival with my children. I got to about $250,000 in income and went, there's got to be something more. And that's when I opened, uh, I, I got another job with Paul Mitchell. And Paul Mitchell saw what I was doing and said, hey, can you teach our salons and spas? I'm like, I don't, I don't really, I never owned a salon and spa. I was my own, I owned a, you know, a little station inside of another salon. They're like, we don't care. What you're doing is amazing. People don't do that in this industry. And I'm a yes, right? I believe, now I believe in God. So whatever your higher power is, you put that word in there. I believe in God. I am who I am, the woman I am, because I, I am on my knees continually asking for guidance. What do I do? How, what's the lesson? This is, I, I will have my pity party. Then I'm like, what is the lesson? What is the lesson that I need to learn? Right? And so um, I'm a yes. I said, God brought this to me. I'm a yes. I don't know how to do it. I'm going to figure it out. I think too many times, and especially if you're very linear, you have to know step A, B, C, D. Life is not A, B, C, D. Life is A, Q, R, elephant, zebra, B, C's, ocean, right? It's like, and so for me and my brain, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm creative. I've, ha I've had to learn the linear. The creative came natural. The linear was very hard for me. And so being a speaker with Paul Mitchell, they said, hey, you know, people would say, Susie, oh my God, do you have a book? I'm like, uh, no, I'm just sharing the good news. <laughs> I don't have a book. Oh, if you, bought, if you wrote a book, we would buy it. Well, you know, like you don't know. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be famous. I'm going to write a book. So my first book, the, the, the publisher rejected me. The only publisher in that industry, they're like, we have a ton of business books. We don't want your book. I'm like, fine. I'll open a publishing company. <laughs> <laughs> I'll Again. solve that not knowing what that meant right so i opened a publishing company published my first book and this was back in the day like i'm talking 30 years ago girl they didn't have the amazon print the all the book resources back in the day you like had to order 2000 books the day those books came to my driveway girl i was like oh crap now i need to sell them i didn't think about selling them i just wrote the book but when they show up in your driveway 2000 books is a lot of books that's a lot of cases that was the first epiphany of like, hmm, maybe I bit off more than I can shoot. <laughs> Ignorance was bliss, right? That's youth. Yeah, that's youth for you. That's how the training and development company started. I didn't start going, I want to be a speaker. I wanted to make a difference. And I think that as entrepreneurs, that as people go, what is your God-given calling? What is God calling you to do? Like you got your hiney handed to you, knocked down physically, mentally, spiritually, you know, with your story to go, what am I called to do? But you got back up again, right? It's like that, the, um, that little song about get back up again. Like I'm going to get back up again. I don't know why. I don't know how that is the dignity of human spirit. Mm -hmm. The dignity of human spirit is, do you have the audacity to get back up again? Now I'm resilient. I just keep getting back up or I'm, you know, ignorance, <laughs> it's ignorance on fire. That's what I was when I was a young girl, ignorance on fire. And so from there, I built one of the largest training and development companies in the beauty industry. And, you know, so we sold that company for millions to the same company that rejected me. That was like a champagne day, right? The company that said, we don't want that. That's too many. They've spent millions to buy our company. And which was amazing, right? It was the first time in my life that I felt like I could breathe. I felt like I had choice. I felt like the universe was conspiring to support me. We had our dream home and our dream cars and traveling all over the world and, and had money in the bank. And then 2007 happened. 
I don't know if y'all remember 2007. I do. 2007 was an economic crisis. Now, ignorance, we were too heavily leveraged in real estate. So we had, you know, millions of assets in real estate that felt like overnight, Jennifer, the rug was pulled out from under us. My marriage of 20 years, this was not to my kid's dad, this was my second marriage. My marriage of 17 years, let me not exaggerate, um, 17 years, he couldn't handle the stress because it was his idea to sell the company. It was his, like the strategies that he fought for in the relationship in our financial, which I agreed to, it wasn't just him, but he felt like a failure. And so he left, he went to Singapore and left his family left me. So I'm dealing with a financial crisis on my own. I'm dealing with this real estate collapse by myself. I'm dealing with this, literally they put a foreclosure sign on my dream home and I've always been fiscally responsible. And it was Valentine's day of all days that I get this, you know, um, foreclosure sign that you've got two weeks and I had been procrastinating. I've been woes me. I got this. He left me, you know, well, that'll snap your ass out of it, right? So I got this piece of paper, had to get in radical action again and having to handle all that. And sometimes when the universe kicks your ass, I'm sorry if I'm swearing, it just comes out. Oh, um, feel if, free. When it kicks your ass, you're like, why, what did I do? Like I, I, I knew for me, I was a good steward. I knew for me, I, I followed my coach's advice. I knew for me, I was seeding back into my communities. I knew for me that I was giving back. I knew for me, I was not selfish. I was not money grubbing. I was, I was doing what I thought was right. Well, you can do what's right and the universe will give you the cosmic boot. And I remember being on the floor, Jennifer bawling and going, what is the lesson? I, my marriage that he said he would never leave me he was my ride or die, my best friend. And I heard this voice in my head that said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Get up. You don't need him. You are the answer. Go tell the people. I'm like, what do you mean go tell the people? I'm not telling people I lost 10 million in assets. Like I'm supposed to be the, the business lady, right? I'm supposed to be like my looking good, my image, my... I'm not telling people this. I'm embarrassed, right? No. And sure enough, you know, I had a cl I had two clients, Lisa Nichols and John Asroff. And I was sitting down with Lisa. She goes, Susie, you're so funny. You just threw the baby out with the bathwater. Like there's no value to what you have just because you lost money. Everybody loses money. She goes, but what I do know about you, you got your papa don't know money. So I know you got some money. <laughs> Which was true, right? I always have my little Papa don't know money. The ladies at the bank cracking me up. They're like, I'm like, Papa don't know about this money. <laughs> you know, I don't know. My grandma taught me that. I always squirrel so many ways. I used to hide it in shoe boxes and books. It's like old school depression shit, probably, right? So she was right, right? I had about a half a million dollars, you know, in investments that, you know, that, that decreased, but I still had money. I still had savings, but not the accumulation of what I spent 20 years doing. And it took me 20 years to build and it was gone overnight. And again, that was the universe giving me the cosmic boot because I had given my husband, because he was also my business partner, the credit for building the business, right? Mm -hmm. I'd given him too much power, like, oh, I can't do it without him because I'm creative, he was linear. And what God showed me was I've always created wealth around me, right? I agreed to the strategies that we did to build our wealth. I, I was the money maker. I was out front, but I wasn't seeing that, right? Cause I was giving you all the credit. Like, oh, it's cause Jennifer, well, it was my husband. We call him my husband. He's the husband. That's a nice, respectful way to say he's out. <laughs> and so I think, um, I know I'm talking a lot, so I want to give you a word in edgewise. No, it's perfect. You're actually, um, you're actually doing great because you're right on point. I've got a couple more questions, but you're right on point because this is the point that I want to illustrate to people is that, you know, a lot of people would look at you and say, oh, she was born with a silver spoon in her mouth, right? <laughs> and that she's had, you know, life was easy for her, you know, and 
um, you know, oh, so she worked, you know, behind the scenes with Lisa Nichols and John Nashroff and, oh, see, you know, it, but no, you literally, you literally came out of this, you know, experience of poverty and, and, and anything but wealth, right? And then you've come full circle. And, and so I, please keep going and sharing about your story, because this is why I feel it's so inspiring and empowering. And what I'd like for you to also do is share, like, what were those lessons? And, and how can people, and this is what I like to teach about now too, don't wait for the proverbial bomb to go off. In my case, it was a literal bomb. Yes. And I can relate to what you're saying, Susie, in that, you know, I was, I didn't value myself yes. the way that, now people, you know, I had all these accolades and all these things. And I just was like, whatever, it just didn't, it was like one more thing, one more certification. Right one more this, one more award, one more that. But the truth is the biggest gift that the bombings gave me was it brought me home to myself, my authentic self. It shattered the facade I was living behind, the looking good, making sure everybody knew that like, God forbid, if they looked underneath the cover, they might see this like, you know, anxiety ridden, panic disorder ridden, depressed on some occasion, like traumatic, like trying to keep my shit together. Cause if people knew, like, I felt like they would disown me yes, and reject me. And so, but the bombing shattered all that. And it taught me how to love myself in ways I hadn't and how to value myself. Now, listen, I'm still mastering that, but it's a far cry from the inner critic who, by the way, I realized the terror, there was a terrorist that lived inside of me. And then yeah. I had to go through a terrorist experience to learn how to rise above that. Right. Juicy. Right. What I think what's powerful is to be able to, I, I always call it like an outside of my body experience that, you know, I've done a lot of, from my first divorce, I've, uh, you know, I've done a lot of investing in my mental health. Right. So I've got three business coaches, right? Two are financial coaches. One is a business coach. I've got a personal development coach. That's my AKA therapist, <laughs> right? I've got a fitness coach, right? I've got, um, right? When I look at the people who are helping me now, I'm not in with them all the time, right? My business and financial coach, we meet quarterly, right? My health coach, I meet with them quarterly, right? To make sure that everything's working at an optimal level. And so everyone that's up to something has a coach, has some level that they're playing to. I'm always looking at what season am I in and what do I need to work on next, right? When you grow up in trauma, you have a trauma response that works for you and then works you, right? So it works for me because I won't give up. And I, I've always known from a very young age that I have to protect myself. I don't depend on anyone. I don't trust anyone right? That's an old trauma response. And to go, oh, maybe I can trust Jennifer. Maybe she can be my girlfriend, right? Normally it takes women and men 10 years to get in my inner circle. 10 years, you got to hang in there. Now I know it, but I still don't, it still doesn't come easy. I like you, right? And people go, oh, you're my best friend. No, I'm not, right? <laughs> because I, I just have the wall. Like, it's not been 10 years. You've not earned that right yet, right? <laughs> Like, here, let's make this harder. But that's trauma response to go, I don't know if I can trust you. And so really this last eight years has it been about, I don't have to be in trauma to survive, right? Before it was like this old belief that, you know, what my dad said, Sue, is you can have anything you want, you just have to work hard. And so that was an old belief that I had. But really what's driving underneath is this trauma response of fight or flight. Like, you know, I'll get you before you get me, which is not healthy. Unconsciously was healthy, allowed me to attain wealth and material things and the drive and, you know, fundamental beliefs without my, my spiritual base, without my, uh, that faith base, I'd be cuckoo pants and probably greedy, right? But that's helped me stay centered, help keep my children centered, 
right? Help me keep my priorities straight on what was important to me. And <clears throat> I think looking at, am I in a trauma response or do I really want to do this? Like you said, that not good enough was fueling you. I'm not good enough, smart enough, pretty enough. I don't have enough accolades. I don't have, everybody has it enough. Mine's good enough, so I'll be better than the best. I'm not good enough. That's the little girl inside of me. And then I'm like, watch, I will show you. Well, that gets you to a certain point and then you're exhausted and fried and that's where burnout comes in. And so I, there's a piece that I respect burnout because it makes me stop. It makes me look at what am I doing? Is it serving me? Is it serving my community? Like having my students watch me burn out, that's not a model I want to teach them. That's a model I want to not teach them to go, let's truly have holistic success. Like COVID had me wake up in a different way because I had it three times. And it's not a short term, it's not like a weekend flu, like it is weeks. And so I really watched students and clients react two ways. One with grace, oh my God, girl, take care of yourself. And the other was like, well, I have this appointment. Well, I am so sorry, but I cannot think. And that was real. And so to put boundaries in place where I never had boundaries in place and work before. It was like, if Jennifer needed me, I dropped everything to help Jennifer versus what do I need right now? What, what would serve me and Jennifer right now? Because if I'm on fumes and just pushing through, I'm not serving Jennifer. You're not serving your clients. We think we are because we grew up in this hero worshiping of I'm sick and I'll come to work anyways. I'm sick and I'll take care of the children anyways. I'm sick and I'll be the, the martyr. She keeps coming back, Jennifer. That martyr keeps coming back. <laughs> But I think it's important for us to identify and the more, the more therapy, the more work you do on yourself and business and in, in your, your emotional well-being. you know, we always say that your net worth will only go as high as your self-worth. And that takes a therapist, personal development, doing the processes you do, right? To release all that baggage that instilled in us 80 percent of our emotional programming is done by the way we're eight by the time we're eight years old so we're all a bunch of little eight-year-olds running around and depending when the trauma hit mine was you know from three to five was the biggest trauma okay so i'm a five-year-old let's be clear right that drama that you know i am a five-year-old and to go i don't want to be five i'm a 50 year old woman i want to be an adult woman responding to the things that i need to respond to from eight years old to 18, you get another 10%, right? So 90% of our emotional response is done by we're 18, which I'm sorry, look at an 18 year old now, we laugh. We all thought we were grown at 18. You look at it like, oh, they're a baby, just a baby, right? And then from 18 to death, you get another 10%. Thank God that 10% is powerful. Thank God, right? We, our brain capacity will let us process things. But when you're in trauma response, if you look at my trauma response was until I was 17, I moved out on my own, but then I continued the trauma response by getting an abusive relationship, right? And, and I didn't do that once. Let me just say, I did not do that once. And then woohoo, magically, right? It went away, right? I kept getting myself in these situations. If it wasn't in my marriage, it was in my women relationships, right? Like, damn it. So I went from man to woman, like business partners or clients, like the clients that I've hated were... A response to my trauma response not hated but you know what i mean like you didn't like working with i didn't hate any of my clients but like the why is she so rude why is she so hard to work with it's like oh trauma response i'm filling a void because you just attract it like that's where you have to be so aware and especially when you do this kind of work like yes i do numbers yes i do business but my work is very intuitive right my work is very um a foundational based inside of spirituality and intuition and doing what you love. And yes, it's numbers because we all got to pay our bills, right? But it's like, what are you committed to? Who are you being? How are you attracting, you know, the ideal client? Why are you attracting a client that's not your ideal client? That's worthiness. If your worthiness sucks, you will not get paid what you're worth. If your worthiness, if you don't have the worthiness that in yourself, you will not make the kind of money that you want. And if you do make the money, it will go through your fingers like sand. So it's important to go, oh, I, you can make money. Like I had a client, girl, we did, we did almost $4 million. And I was seeing this pattern with her that she would blow through money 
hire people, blow through her own money, like have no wealth strategy for herself, just constantly sabotaging. I'm like, holy cow, that younger belief of worthiness to accumulate wasn't present. I'm like, you gotta go therapy because I can help you make a lot of money, but you gotta go therapy. And that was a hard conversation because therapy is scary because you got to look at your inner demons. Therapy is vulnerable, right? It brings up all that stuff. Nobody wants to deal with that. You want to squash it in the squishy squasher. But the squishy squasher, it just keeps coming back. There's that saying, your past will sit in your future until you complete with the past. And notice, if you don't believe this, notice the chaos that's around you. Look at what's happening in your life. And that's how I see what I'm committed to. When I've got drama, breakdown, struggle, like I'm sitting inside that for some reason. Like that's why I'm so committed to telling the truth. Like I don't want to stuff what's happening in my life. Right. Jennifer and I were talking about right before we came on. I'm like, I need to be transparent. Uh, my grandbaby has to have brain surgery. That's huge. I don't want to squash it in the squishy squash and pretend it's not there. Like. I need people to know before I'm going into something to go and I'm going to rise and I'm going to thrive and I'm going to have my community be the armor bears for me. You can hold me up. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, but I need to be held up, right? To go that you got to have a community like this. Like Jennifer's community is ride or die. Jennifer's community is how do we rally my community? Same way. Come for the education, stay for the people because the people are badass and they are people that will not give up on you. And they'll call you on your stuff lovingly, right? To go, let me help you, right? Let me surround you with love. And I think that's what business needs now is we don't need to be in all this masculine energy all the time, even if you're a man, right? That driving and pushing and, you know, pushing it uphill, making it happen. You're just tired and then you got to figure out how to go downhill, right? Which is normally rolling. <laughs> yeah. And I, oh, think, <laughs> I think that's the key point is that we're at a point, you know, a lot of people in the financial world, in the economic world, to say that you know we're 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 due for another 2007, 2008 economic recession. And I want to say to people, whether or not that happens, you get to control um, how you persevere through that storm. It's no different than you know the weather forecaster saying, "Hey, there's a storm coming your way." Well, plan for that, and you know, pivot and get yourself in a place where you know who you are and who you're here to serve and keep focusing on that. Don't focus on the external that coulda, shoulda, woulda been type of thing because that's not going to get you anywhere. And that, you know, that actually pivots into your, you know, we've been in the pandemic now for over two years. Um, most people like yourself haven't had any live events um, in that time period, but you have your, your first live event coming up in September. And it's, um, it's it, you know, invitation only, basically, um, for those people who are ready to jump in, have fun, have, you know, and be playful and lighten things up, but, but be serious, be serious about wanting to, you know, look at their business and reinvent and re-engineer their business for growth and for profitability going into the next season. So will you tell us a little bit about the September event? Um, I believe there's 50 people that up, no more than 50 people can attend. Um, and so these are for people who are really serious about wanting to reinvent their business and take it to the next level. Well, I love that you said it really is like, how do you thrive in any economic crisis, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a recession or a depression, like you think back in the recession that I talked about losing $10 million. I got up and I thrived, right? Not that I don't want anybody ever have to lose that, that amount of money, right? But if I look at this event, one live is amazing because you get belly to belly, heart to heart, right? And really find those strategic partnerships. So first of all, it's only 50 people. Could we have hundreds? Yes, but I don't want 100 people. I want 50 people who are truly committed to laying out their roadmap to building their dream business. Right. So what do I need to put in place? I've got 30 years of growing and scaling businesses for myself and for my student, students. I've, I've built 10 multi-million dollar companies and two $10 million companies. There's a system, right? I can create Jennifer business and make it, okay, here's what we do next. Here's what we do next. Here's what we do next. Don't do that. Do this. And especially when the economic times are hard, 
right? Looking at everything from your pricing and your pricing is value-based on what you think up here. I don't want you to base your pricing on what you feel. I want to base it on facts because when you base it on facts, then you can't undercharge because you're like, oh, this is what it cost me. I can't undercharge. And so I want us to look at your whole business holistically. And students that have come out of this event have had 150% increase. They've had 400% increase, right, inside of their businesses because they had a strong roadmap, right? So it's all about stepping up and get rid of what's no longer working and creating something that's better than ever. Because every time there's been a crisis, I come back better than ever. I don't like it. Let me just say, I don't like it. I don't like the bloody knees and bloody elbows. And I can talk about it when I'm done with it. <laughs> but let's use that to propel you to that next level. Let's look at what does it take to be a profitable business, right? And then to network with people like Jennifer and I, right? People who get business, who are committed to you, that want to partner, that want to play, that has been there, done that, will tell you the truth. I'm gonna tell you the truth and show you behind the black curtain. Like, here's what it really is. This is what you have to do. You can't just put up a website and collect money. That does, that's, that really pisses me off, right? When, when experts say that, I'm like, come on. You just wanna sell, you don't wanna serve. Because there's so much more to that because there's no strategy. Yeah, we can put a sales page up, you can create a product, but if you don't have a sales strategy, not going to happen. So I believe that math is money. Money is fun. Business should be fun or don't do it. Right. So let's have fun. Three days of fun in San Diego, beautiful San Diego. Right. Um, because we're on Jennifer's call, you'll get $200 off your ticket. Right. So it's normally $17.95 and it'll be, so what is that? $15.95 yeah, um, for the ticket. So I'd love for you to come right we have some amazing people that'll be there with you you know badass people so come come and put a roadmap together don't stay stuck let's skyrocket your business to the next level and the dates again are september 22nd 23rd 24th so 23rd 24th 25th 23rd 24th 25th and so if you are wanting to take your business to the next level and the way i look at this is that this is an investment in you and as susie said if you come and you show up ready to play full out, you'll get your investment back in more. And not only that, what I've come to understand from Susie is you'll walk away with strategies with, you know, but more importantly, relationships with people that really do mean business and really, you know, want to want to see you succeed. Like they're not, they're not competitors. They're here to see you thrive in, in any situation. So if that is something of interest to you, check it out. We'll include the link um, in the show notes. And I guess, you know, any last words of wisdom, Susie, what would you say to people um, who might be going through their own challenging time, which by the way, I want to, I want to add something in here. Every challenging situation I've come to understand, it's taken me 50 years to learn this. It means it's a growth opportunity. Right. And you have a choice. You have a choice to break outside your comfort zone, to rise and thrive to your next best level of self, or you can be a victim to the experience and to the circumstance and let it bury you. And it's solely your choice. But what would you say to, to listeners today? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I read your mind. Drop the mic, girl. Drop the mic. I don't need to say anything, but amen. <laughs> and and I just want to say, like on a on a uh, on a personal note, you know, I do absolutely believe in the power of prayer. And what was astounding to me is that complete strangers prayed for me and my fellow survivors of the Boston Marathon bombings. And I thought, who does that? Yeah. Extraordinary people do that people who care no matter who you are. And so Susie mentioned that her granddaughter, Naomi, who's two years old, is dealing with some health issues and may need brain surgery. And I believe in the power of prayer. So if we can come together and say our prayers for Naomi and Naomi's parents, Amanda and Alan, and to Susie and the rest of their family, I believe in miracles. And I believe when we send those good vibes out, they also come back to you tenfold. So with that, Susie, thank you for your time, your energy, your laughter, and just being the 
inspirational, badass woman that you are out there in the world. Thank you. And thank you for that call for prayer. It means a lot to me. Yeah. And keep us posted. Um, we want, you know, I do believe in miracles and I do believe yes. that some, you know, something powerful will happen. Um, so yes. keep us amen again. Amen. <laughs> it's my you. sister. Stay tuned amen. for our next episode. Uh, Susie, thank you again. And, and to everyone out there listening, remember you have the power within you to rise and thrive no matter what.